Right, so welcome back everyone. This is session room number two. I hope you are all well rested after the break. And uh, we have Lucas Fernandez Aragon and Maulik Shark, bo both from Red Hat here. And the topic will be implementing high availability for the cloud. Okay, guys, you can take it away. Yep, thank you. So good morning, folks. Thank you very much. Good morning. Like, <laughs> hi, I'm Lucas. I'm a software engineer in the AI service team at Red Hat. I'm a full stack developer that now works in the SRE part of the project. I've been working in the Red Hat OpenShift Data Science platform for about nine months right now. And today we're going to talk about like the features we've implemented in it. Oh, I, I love music and I used to play in a few bands and I love cats. And okay. here's my teammate, yeah. Molek. <laughs> hey, I'm Molek. I'm also a software engineer on the same team as Lucas, which is the AI services here at Red Hat. I've been working on this project called Roads for like all my career after graduating, which is about four years. I also contributed most of this components to the upstream project, which is Open Data Hub, and I play a bunch of video games, and I love all the cats that my teammates have. So let's... Yeah. Uh, we're going to start talking about high availability. Yeah, like just a quick introduction. Uh, high availability is a term used to describe the period of time when a service is available, as well as the time required by a system to respond to a request or a user interaction. So in terms of a service deployed, high availability is the quality of that service or a component to assure performance for a period of time. When setting up deployments, minimizing downtimes and service interruption is one of our highest priorities. Downtimes are the key areas in customer insatisfaction. Take into account that a system that guarantees 99% of availability in a year can have up to 3.65 days of downtime. That's a lot. So we are aiming like a 99.99 time percent of availability. That's less than a day. The main goal with high availability is to identify single points of failure in our system. And this single point points of failures are elements that could cause a service interruption. And now we're going to attack how we have identified them and how we have implemented high availability in our components. So first of them, it's Jupyter Hub. Jupyter Hub is the most popular Jupyter notebook and Jupyter Lab environment. Uh, it's a way to go when you need to serve Jupyter notebooks. Well, what's a notebook? Uh, there are applications for data scientists and AI engineers for creating and sharing computational documents. They're widely used for people around the, go the, the world to process data, create AI models, train and share them with local setups and dependency ma management. As we can see in the picture here, uh, the architecture is easily, it can be easily adaptable to our services, to fit our services. Having the hub servers here at the center, that's the one controlling uh, the database, the authentication management, the spanners, like the actual notebooks, and like it's being redirected by the proxies. And now Moet's going to talk about traffic. Yep. So Jupyter and traffic were the two biggest point of failures, which are coupled tightly <coughs> in the service. Now the goal was how to get this to high availability. So Jupyter had an in-memory proxy where a user request comes in, it sees what's in memory and it routes it to the correct pod. But what if the Jupyter server pod went down? We lose all the proxy information. So the first goal was to decouple the traffic proc the proxy into this external traffic proxy, which is like a basically an edge router, which follows like this set of dumb rules in a HCD cluster or like any key value pair where it just says, oh, an incoming request comes in. Hmm, I know what to do with this. I'll just send it to the right pod. If if it doesn't know what to do with it, like the rule doesn't exist yet, it just sends it to like the main Jupyter Hub server for like login, authentication, and spawning operations. And that's pretty much all Traffic does. We ended up using it because it's super lightweight. It's highly resilient. It's horizontally scalable, and that just solved all of our purposes. Where we are not spending a bunch of computation to run a proxy, and if anything goes down, something else just takes over, and it just works. So 
this is the architecture that we are talking about here for Jupyter Hub and Prefig, where a user logs into the dashboard, it goes request goes to the load balancer, where it goes to the Prefig. Now for a new request, what it does is it's routed to the Jupyter Hub server pod, where it sees, okay, this user does not have a running notebook pod. It, it spawns a notebook pod for the user backed by a PVC, and it writes that traffic rule to a config map where the traffic is constantly looking at the config map to see is there any update to the routing rules. So once this notebook pod is up and running, the uh, rule is con committed to the config map. Traffic just takes that request, routes it to the notebook pod. Now, Jupyter Hub is a stateful application. So we ended, uh, which needs like a lock on the database, but how do we make the database persistent and highly available? So for production clusters, we ended up using IDS, which is Amazon Relational Database Service. And for like internal clusters, we ended up using PostgreSQL operator, which provides a good enough solution for our internal purposes, but not like customer production ready use cases. So one interesting thing that we did here was Jupyter for traffic, it need like an HCD backing, but for the core of it, it just needed somewhere it can read the rules in a key value pair. So instead of running like yet another service which could fail, we just tried to leverage like Kubernetes APIs itself. In this case, a config map where Jupyter Hub server writes to it exclusively and traffic just reads excessively for it. And hey, it works. And it's again persistent, backed by the Kubernetes cluster itself. Like if the config map is failing, you probably have bigger problems with the cluster itself instead of the servers. So this is the final architecture that we ended up like going ahead with. And we have been able to achieve 99.99% percent .99 uptime in all almost all our clusters, barring like some weird problems which were like the root cause of which were not our service itself. So moving ahead with the demo, let's go to this. So here I have a cluster with like the whole project running. As we can see, we have three traffic proxy, like again, horizontally scalable. We have the dashboards running. We have the Jupyter Hub server running. As you can see, Jupyter Hub is a stateful application. You can't horizontally scale it. So what we ended up doing was have like a leader election kind of thing here where there would always be like one leader pod. So where it's, you can see like, once it starts, it's trying to acquire like leader lease. It couldn't, so, well, it could. So it started leading with just the same pod. If we were go to a separate pod, uh, Jupiter Hub, actually, it's going to say it's trying to acquire the leader lease, but then it just found out, oh, a new leader was already elected. So we have this other pod, which is now the leader. Now, if that pod were to go down, for example, in this scenario, um, I'm just waiting for one of these pods to take over. It takes around five seconds. That's the only downtime which we can see in the system, which is about five, six seconds generally. So yep, as you can see, a new leader was just elected. And so this pod, which was running since like some time now, instead of the one that's been up, it got elected as leader and it started running its thing. So in this case, what Jupyter Hub only does is authentication and spawn operation. So while the seed election, the only downtime that we really have is the spawn operations. But if a user were to have like an already running pod, so let's scale down Jupyter Hub. So if Jupyter Hub was down altogether, but I as a user already have like a running pod, the horizontally scalable traffic proxy would just take me to it. Oh, oh maybe I'm not authenticated. Oh, yeah, I think you haven't created <laughs> ever. Let's check. Uh -huh. Yep. 
So give me one second. I'll show this it works. So let's go to the traffic part of it. Now, if we were to scale down traffic to like maybe one available pod in this scenario. Yep, it still routes just fine. So it's probably gonna ask me to log in here, which is why. Alrighty, so let's do this for I in range 500. Yeah, import time. <laughs> I'm trying to do that. It's not uh, import time. So it's Perfect. doing its thing. Now I should have a valid session cookie. So now let's scale down Jupyter Hub. And yep, Jupyter Hub's gone. Oh, why is it doing this? Ah, I know why. Let's try to. Yep. So if I have a valid user notebook part running, it should take me to that with even if Jupyter is completely offline. So what this does is minimize the downtime for like most of the users, except the ones who are trying to log in while the leader election is taking place. We haven't seen a scene where like Jupyter is completely out with no active leaders. The only downtime we have had there were like for like barely five, six seconds for the new reaction to take place. Yet another solution that we ended up customizing, like implementing custom was. So uh, where are the config maps? Yep. So as you can see here, we have those traffic rules config map where whenever a new user server comes up, Jupyter just writes the routing information to it to this config map, which traffic would constantly read in the loop. Well, not a loop. We are now telling traffic there's an update to config map, take this new file kind of thing using Qube APIs. And this is how we were able to achieve 99.99% uptime for Jupyter Hub. And the thing I wanted to highlight was we can have similar strategies for any applications where if it's horizontally scalable, you just scale it. If there's something where you need persistence, you could use like Kubernetes secrets or config maps to have that backing storage for information like that. For stateful applications, you could still run multiple pods. All you need to do is add leader election sidecars and you would always have that one active and two hot swappable nodes ready to go. So. And that was like the bigger focus on this instead of Jupyter, but how do we take any services and get it to a highly available state or not to IHA, but as close to it as possible, where you don't have to worry about getting pinged at three in the night. Yeah. And yeah. just to, yeah, yeah. And just to add like what you've said, uh, for example, in the later election, uh, the, the current implementation led to some drawbacks that we need to address it. For example, uh, we need to add some deepness and readiness probe because when we added a uh, leader election, it's a mechanism as any other and <laughs> it will have some problems. For example, uh, the load balancing, we're redirecting traffic to all three pods, even the, the ones are, the, that weren't elected. So we need to implement a, a readiness probe in order to say, hey, <laughs> I'm the one hey, who's giving the, the traffic. And also, like, it could lead to fencing in which uh, two or more uh, uh, leaders could be elected. It's some sub log problem with race condition and these kind of things. So, yeah, we have a litmus proof. And when it, this problem may occur, the non-leader elected will be killed. So, yeah, that's things that we need to take into account 
when we have like new mechanisms uh, as this, like it could lead to, to another uh, single point of failure that you need to address. And uh, yeah, that leads us to lessons learned. Yep. And um, yeah, like uh, we we have <laughs> a lot of things to go, cover up here, and just like our three main topics are uh, first simplify things. For example, in the leader action, we try to use an old image for leader action, but we then realized it was not supported anymore, and we wanted a more basic leader election mechanism. So we ended up implementing our, ourselves, and instead of trying complex architectures, we identify our needs and turn that that like turn out that it was a simple implementation, the thing that we needed. So yeah, we went for it. Then think about SRE. Uh, for example, it's never a good idea to run a database on the same cluster as the service because, because if something goes wrong, there is a of catastrophic failure. And this leads to our last point that things break. You must always bear in mind that things could break. And we, as a developers, uh, need to have redundancy in as few points uh, at the, uh, in a few points of failure as possible. So that's why we have the config mask for projecting routes, replications in both traffic and Jupyter separate pods, props for the liberal action mechanism, both Amazon ARDS and Postgres SQL for storing database and more. So yeah, we always bear in mind that and we try to act up and um, prevent those those issues. And yeah, last but not least, uh, we have all the repositories uh, with the actual code and the built image. And if you want to test them or like look at the code, you can go there and, and check it. So yeah, I hope you enjoy our talk and I guess let's proceed to the Q&A. Yeah. So. Yeah, let's go with the Q&A. Any, any, any questions? I don't see any questions from the audience. <clears throat> we still have a couple of minutes left. No, no questions in the Q&A, no questions in the chat. So I think that's it for now. But yeah, of course, uh, really Lucas here. and Malik might be hanging around in the Rocket Adventure afterwards. So I think you can meet there. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for the presentation. Thanks for, thanks for oh, watching. Like, thank you. to each other at any time. And I'm going to post our GitHub links here. For sure.